Katz with Gallery Glass, and I'm here to speak with documentary filmmaker Jean Marie Offenbacher. Can you tell me a little bit about the film? Yes, the film is a documentary portrait of Syria, and I moved there in 2004, and I lived there for three years recording life around me, and I went out of my way to interview government officials, taxi drivers, actors, farmers, uh, Bedouins. I raced Bedouins on horseback. I won. <laughs> I'm sure you did. That's it, fascinating. It was a really exciting period in my life, and I went there because I realized that from that after we invaded Iraq, that the language that had been just used to justify our invasion of Iraq was being used to describe Iran and Syria. And so you were really looking to unveil the, the misconceptions. Yes, I, I didn't know what, what was true. I'd never been to the Middle East, but I knew that what was being reported in the media was illogical. So three years there is, is quite a long time. Obviously, you didn't feel like you had fulfilled your mission for, for an extended period of time. Is that what kept you there? Or is there I a... loved it. I tried to buy a house in Aleppo, which, I'm, you know, it's actually the house I was going to buy has been blown up. Um, since then, it was a fabulous place. But no, I, I had a wonderful time there. People were so nice. And, and I would come home, people would say, oh, it's so brave of you. And, it's not brave at all. They said brave is coming home and having to get my ego back in check because when I'm in Syria, I'm the exotic one. And it's incredibly safe. I could walk around with money literally hanging out of my pocket, my camera, and I always carried money because it was largely a cash economy. But I never had problems even with, you know, I thought that the man would bother me because I was younger and prettier and I didn't actually have problems. In fact, sometimes I would say, what's wrong? Do I, do I look ugly? <laughs> well, all of your experience seems incredibly positive. Can you tell me about the content of the film? Um, yes, yes. Actually, what the film ends up doing, because I, I went, I didn't spend enough solid three years. I went back and forth for three years. I'd be three months there, four months there, and then come home for a few months. But the, uh, what, what happens in the film is that I, I kind of, I track a political shift because when I was when I first arrived, uh, there were no sanctions against Syria. The U.S. was already you know, using this rhetoric that was quite ugly to describe Syria, and and it, they had already been uh, put on the axis of evil. But there were no sanctions. After Rafi Hariri was blown up in 2005, they brought the U.S. brought sanctions against Syria, and and there was a real there was a pretty major shift in political temperature at that at that point. And there was also another shift. The, the government started becoming more conservative. And the other thing that happened was that you started seeing more women in hijab. And you started feeling this presence more and seeing resentment. When I first arrived, for instance, there was one actress who asked me why I was always asking about hijab. Why do people from the West, why are they so obsessed? And she said, because we don't see it. We don't care. If you wear a hijab, if you don't wear a hijab. And she said, of course, most people in Syria do not wear a hijab, but we don't care. Because if somebody wants to cover, they can cover. And, uh, and we're all the same. It's your choice. If you want to wear it, you don't wear it. And then three years later, she said, those women in black, they cover, they're garbage. So there was this tension that was building in Syria be between these people because we, I was seeing more and more people from Saudi, and more people from outside were having a presence on the street. And uh, so there was a little tension, but it was still wonderful. It was still pretty harmless. It was just, you could do, there was some, some tension, but it wasn't like fear. It was just like, you could see that it was grating on people's nerves, that there were two more women in hijab and there was a judgment thing happening. And when I first arrived, that, that was actually what was most striking about Syria was that there was this complete suspension of judgment. It was not, not just a tolerant society, it was a harmonious society. I didn't know what religion half of my friends were. It, it, it would come up because I would bring it up in interviews and talk, and, you know, and I love to talk about politics and religion, so I'd get people talking about politics and religion. So eventually I would know what religion, probably, I still only knew, about the, knew the religion was about half the people I hung out with. It was quite open, and even people I knew who, who were extremely conservative Sunni Muslims, they didn't care if I drank. They didn't care that I'm wearing jeans and riding horses and riding motorcycles. They, they were totally 
uh, happy to have me around. They're actually really happy to have me around. And some of the women would give me their children because they say, oh, they can have more fun with you out on these adventures. Because I remember some of them saying, like, what am I going to do where I'm dressed like this? <laughs> She's covered. <laughs> what do your friends, and given everything in the news today, what do your friends in Syria, who still live in Syria, think about the film that you've made? What, what do they feel about the message that you're looking to send? Well, and the story that you're looking to tell. The people there, uh, some of the people, I'm, I've lost touch with a lot of people. I'm still in touch with, with a lot of people too, though. Um, some people have been killed. A lot of people have been displaced. But the people I, I'm in touch with who are still in uh, Latakia, Aleppo, Deir and um, Damascus um, are mostly, well, we're communicating over the internet. so. I have to read between lines, but I, I, I gather, I mean, people definitely want me to show the film more because they're, they're still watching TV. They're still seeing international media and seeing the way that they're being depicted. And international media tends to focus on the French lunatics and on the really poor and the uneducated. When you, when they go, when the news teams go into Arab countries, it's like they go out of their way to find the least educated, the most impoverished people to focus their lenses on. and. In Syria, they, they actually had a very large middle class, and uh, and it was required that every child learn French and English from age six, in, and that's in the public schools. That's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, that's something I feel like you know Americans should know that. And and uh, Bashar Assad used to go out, and he would he would have pizza. He would be out on his bike with his kids. The first time I filmed him. He was at this, this uh, museum opening, and a friend of mine told me he was there. He knew I wanted to, to do an interview with Bashar Assad. And so he told me, and I, I went running across the, this, this lawn and running. And as I'm running, I'm pulling out my camera and I'm pulling out my shotgun microphone and running toward the president with this shotgun microphone pointing at him. And everyone was just polite. And they let me film him. I didn't get to do an interview, but I, you know, I filmed him. And then another time, he showed up at, the, at my friend's theater, avant-garde theater production. And he walked in, and you know, it's this very lefty audience, and everybody uh, clapped and looked really happy that Bashar and Asma showed up. Quite a quite a shift. Yeah, they were so relaxed. And, pre and just present on the street. And, and a friend of mine tells me in the film, she talks about seeing him in a restaurant, going over and complaining about conditions in the university and you know, having a drink with them. And they gave, you know, Asma gave her her phone number. So if she had anything else she'd like to discuss. And they were very present for the people. And so it's, it's pretty heartbreaking. And, I, and I, I, also, I don't think that Bashar is entirely in charge of Syria. I think that there's, there's a, the security apparatus has a stranglehold on the government. So when I see the chemical weapons, I think I, I wouldn't believe in a thousand years that Bashar had anything to do with that. 